So hi Sachin, um, and welcome to the ONS Spotlight on 5G Transformation with Open Source. Uh, this is the session on virtualization and disaggregation of uh, radio access networks and telco networks in general. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Professor Sachin Katti. Uh, he's a pioneer and leader in uh, 5G space, especially when it comes to uh, uh, disaggregation, virtualization, and open interfaces for radio access networks and the 5G networks in general. Uh, he is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at uh, Stanford University. He is also an advisor to VMware uh, for the strategy on 5G. Uh, as, uh, uh, as a pioneer, he was the one who initially co-founded XRAN. Uh, which was a foundation that was dedicated to, again, disaggregation of RAN and creating open interfaces for RAN. And then uh, with CRAN, uh, that was a China, uh, China mobile initiative, XRAN and CRAN joined forces and created ORAN um, and ORAN Alliance. And Sachin is the uh, co-chair of ORAN uh, Technical Steering Committee. Okay, um, Sachin has always has always has been an entrepreneur as well. Uh, he started a company called Kumo Networks uh, that was based on a major technological breakthrough um, uh, by his team at Stanford University about full duplex radio transmission. Uh, then he started another company called Yuhana that was about creating an AI platform for RAN, and that is the company that VMware acquired. And um, uh, that is where he is as an advisor right now. So with that, uh, Sachin, again, welcome. And thanks for doing the keynote. And it's all yours. Thanks, Guru. And thank you for inviting me. As uh, Guru mentioned in, uh, in, this, in that uh, long introduction, I wear a few different hats. And uh, uh, what I'll do today is kind of actually try and give a perspective from all of those hats. Right. So uh, as Guru mentioned, I'm spending time at VMware uh, running strategy, uh, but also co-chair the ORAN Alliance. And so the perspective I want to take today is what's happening uh, as we see the telco network from a cloud perspective. Uh, how does that apply to the radio access network and how does that apply to opening up and uh, disaggregating the network? So I'll have uh, twin perspectives as I, as I deliver this keynote. So uh, fundamentally, I think the problem that uh, a lot of the telcos and communication service providers are thinking through is how do they go into a much more uh, cloud-centric, agile, horizontal model of uh, delivering their network. So the network should be a piece of software that's running on a platform rather than a collection of boxes uh, that you're typically used to. And there are a few different priorities that you hear about uh, from the telcos themselves. Obviously, there's the transition to 5G and there's a core build-out that's happening. And the transition there, of course, is that people want to go to a containerized uh, core. Uh, the edge cloud is picking up. Uh, there's a lot of movement in the industry around more and more edge cloud deployments. And so how does the telco network extend to the edge? Finally, with ORAN, and this is where I've been heavily involved, is how do we disaggregate the radio access network and then how do we virtualize and deliver it in such a disaggregated fashion? And this eventually bleeds into uh, delivering private 5G. So essentially extending the telco cellular network all the way inside the enterprise uh, with private 5G deployments. So these are common themes that we see across the world. And fundamentally, the approach uh, that, uh, that um, we are thinking through here is how do we deliver this as a platform, right? So instead of thinking of private 5G as a domain, RAN as a domain, core as a domain, and maybe these are different silos, these essentially become services that are delivered on top of a cloud platform. And that cloud platform has to do a few different things, right? So it has to deliver a consistent infrastructure layer that can span across all of these domains, enable you to uh, get the benefits of automation. So you should be able to get the same kind of operational uh, agility uh, that you're used to when people deploy on public clouds. But that's, in, that's not enough. Even after you deploy, after you automate, you need to make sure that you can assure, operate, and optimize these services because ultimately these are mission critical services and you need to deliver the network service that people signed up for. So how do you actually operationalize this as you span across these different domains, potentially in a multi-vendor fashion? So it's really 
going from a vertical siloed approach to this horizontal centric approach. That's the platforms uh, that, that we're building here. And I think if I take that from a VMA perspective, there's kind of three layers uh, that, that I'll highlight here. Uh, so, and all of these are essentially multi-cloud. And what that means is that there's an infrastructure layer that can be deployed from the core edge all the way into the RAN and private 5G, private networks. And it's the same consistent abstraction, but it could have different capabilities based on the workload underneath. So when you, for example, get to the radio workload, we will talk about this in a minute, is how do you handle very latency sensitive workloads on such a cloudified infrastructure? But the abstraction layer of how you actually manage the containers, how you manage the virtual machines, how you deploy, configure, all of that stays the same. So you get operational efficiencies as you go across the different domains. The second layer is the automation layer. And this is where the challenge really becomes uh, large in a telco context. Because when we think about automation in a cloud, you really think about maybe one or two cloud instances. But in a telco network, the picture I like to draw in my head is, it's literally hundreds of little clouds, right? So a big network in the US is probably 10 to 11 national data centers, maybe another 20 to 50 regional data centers, and then hundreds of central offices. And the intent here is, that all of these are essentially going to be clouds rather than proprietary boxes. So if I now zoom back out, uh, this is a scary picture for a telco to think through, which is I have hundreds of little clouds that I need to manage. And if I have to go manage each one of them, one after the other as an independent entity, that just won't scale. You will need a lot more people to do that. That's going to be really hard. So how do you build an automation uh, layer that is multi-cloud that can give you a centralized way of logically managing all of these physically distributed cloud instances. And that's really the, the automation layer. And there the transition of that also needs to be handled is the transition from virtual machines uh, to containers, uh, which is another transition that's happening in the telco world. So that's, those are kind of cloud infrastructure uh, stories. The last one is the operations layer on top. And this is where once you've deployed an infrastructure, once you've automated it, once you've deployed the network functions, stitch them together into an end-to-end -end service, then what? And you still have to make sure that the service is up and running and delivering performance as it's expected to do. So you need to assure it, you need to optimize it, you need to root cause it. And uh, Telco Cloud Operations is uh, trying to do that, which is build again a layer that spans the whole stack and is end-to-end on uh, delivering the day two operations uh, that these networks need. So the one point I'll make here, which is kind of subtle, but very important is, as telcos go towards a disaggregated world, where they are picking and choosing multiple vendors for different network functions and stitching them together, one natural question that a lot of, I, I get asked all the time is, how do we, we are going from a single neck to choke to a world where no one knows what's what's happening, right? Because you have multiple entities being put together. And I think that's where the a, a unified multi-vendor operations layer is critical because you need a layer on top that can collect data from all the different components in the stack, from all the different vendors in a unified manner and allow you to root cause and understand when something is going wrong. How do I triage and how do I figure out who is the one that I need to make a phone call to? So a critical component of disaggregation, if you want need to deliver on a disaggregation strategy, is to have a very unified uh, multi-vendor data story to go along with it, because that's how you are actually going to be able to manage the complexity of disaggregation and make sure that you do not get uh, uh, into a situation where different vendors are just kind of blaming each other. Right. So that's the that's the triage piece. That's why the operations is a very subtle but very important piece of enabling disaggregation, even though it seems like a day two story after you have done the disaggregation. It actually needs needs to be thought through when you're thinking through the disaggregation, what the operations layer uh, is going to look like. So that that's kind of the stack. I already talked through the through this picture, but just wanted to kind of to highlight where the, where the world is today or was and where we are trying to get to, right? So even if things are virtualized today, even if things are containerized, it really, what has really happened is people have taken hardware appliances and created them into vertical software silos, right? And so you essentially have different stacks for each uh, functionality. So the EPC will have a different stack, the IMS will have a different stack, the RAN will have a different stack. 
So this hasn't really accomplished much. All we have done really is virtualized it, but it's still a single mon monolithic black box uh, that you have managed to put together. And so really the vision here is that uh, instead of having these kinds of complex siloed environments, disjointed solutions that span the different domains, because then it makes really operations uh, really hard. And the, the, there's no multi-vendor operational layer that kind of uh, spans across these different, uh, different layers. What you really want to go towards is a fundamentally a consistent layer, right? So again, a platform, have a consistent and unified platform that spans across all of these different domains have a way to manage this platform in a centralized manner. So this was that multi-cloud point that I was talking about, which is that the telco world looks like hundreds of clouds and how do you manage those all those clouds in a centralized manner rather than have to do them individually. Have the ability to uh, have an ecosystem. So a platform is only as successful as the ecosystem on top of it. Right? So you, we, we can talk about platforms all day, but if there's no ecosystem of network functions to go alongside it, then it's not useful to the to the to the to the telco itself. So how do you actually build and certify and integrate or pre-integrate an ecosystem of choices for the operator? Right? Because if the operator or the telco has to actually take uh, software from uh, somewhere, build a platform, and then they have to do the dirty work of integration, uh, in my opinion, it's gonna it's it it will limit the applicability of such an architecture to a handful of uh, telcos around the world who have the scale to do it. But for the larger generation of telco, larger set of telcos who are relatively smaller, uh, they, they want to enjoy the benefits of this aggregation. They want to enjoy the benefits of platformization. To deliver that, you need someone who can actually pre-integrate the whole ecosystem or a big chunk of the ecosystem on top of this platform. So a critical piece of uh, succeeding on a platform approach is having a multi-vendor network function ecosystem uh, that sits on top. And the last piece, as we talked about, was that multi-layer automation and operation story to make sure that all of these components, after they're deployed, can be managed in an automated fashion, can be operated, assured, and optimized in an automated manner. So that's kind of the picture uh, we're trying to get to. So this is uh, more of a VMware-centric uh, stack, right? And I won't spend uh, too many details on this. The only reason I put this here was kind of highlight one thing that is more plumbing, but actually critically important. I think one of the things that we are seeing, of course, is that the telcos are in this hybrid world where people are going from uh, VNFs uh, to CNFs. And even within the VNFs, there are different stacks there there are different vim stacks there's open stack and then there's of course vmware's own stack and so on so how do you handle such hybrid workloads because on the same cloud you might actually have vnfs from from that from an older generation especially for LT. and as you transition to 5g uh, there is a growing uh, interest from the telcos and having everything containerized so you might have containers cnfs and vnfs sitting on top of the same infrastructure so a critical piece of the complexity of delivering a platform is something that can treat both of these as first class citizens and give you the same operational tool chain to manage both kinds of network functions, whether it's VNFs or CNFs. Because if, uh, again, the container transition and the cloud native transition requires, I need to build a completely new tool chain to manage that, that will slow down that transition significantly. So how do you again build that operational tool chain that gives you a consistent interface uh, to manage this? And so that's really where this picture really comes in, which is you can have uh, VMware VNFs, OpenStack VNFs, and then uh, cloud native kind of containerized network functions all being deployed and managed in a consistent manner uh, with this automation layer. And that actually is a critical piece regardless of VMware or whoever it is. Uh, I think it's an important uh, operational headache that needs to be solved because otherwise you will again end up with silos between the VNF world and the CNF world uh, that we're seeing. So that's the larger uh, strategy. And I think the question that I wanted to kind of shift to was how does this apply to the, to the radio access network, right? And uh, this is where ORAN comes in. Uh, and ORAN, I mean, at a high level, uh, there are a few goals, a uh, few objectives uh, it was trying to drive. And so uh, first one was obviously uh, reduce, uh, reduce OPEX and reduce the CAPEX. And so let's start with the CAPEX. Uh, the, the goal is to make sure that instead of having black box proprietary hardware, uh, you can move towards a more off-the-shelf hardware and leverage the 
kind of compute silicon improvements that are happening because of the rest of the world. Essentially get uh, data center economics, but apply it to the radio access network. So how do you get that? So how do you decouple uh, the baseband software from the underlying hardware? So that's one aspect. The second aspect was reduce OPEX and increase agility. And how do you actually make sure that a lot of these uh, functions are programmable, are, uh, are uh, can be orchestrated and managed using open interfaces? So those go hand in hand. Being able to introduce new capabilities, the agility comes in. Uh, this the RAN ecosystem has historically been closed. Uh, you, it's been really challenging for startups to enter and introduce new technology. So how do we build innovation? How do we build APIs for innovation to be introduced without that startup having to build the whole thing? So that is one key piece. And related to that is how do you have open interfaces to enable uh, multi-vendor management, right? So again, even in the RAN, the management systems were also had to be put all, almost always deployed from the same vendor who was providing the RAN infrastructure. And this again led to silos because if you had two or three different RAN vendors, you essentially had two or three different management systems uh, that had to manage the RAN. So to reduce OPEX, how do you get that platform approach to play is by having open interfaces uh, into the underlying infrastructure. So ORAN really was an effort, as many of you know, to help drive this kind of uh, standardization to this kind of horizontalization into the radio access network uh, with, these, uh, with these objectives. And it's an operator driven body uh, that is trying to define the architecture such that we can uh, move towards such uh, modern architectures. Now, uh, just a little bit of primer, I'm gonna spend two minutes on what ORAN is because that will set context uh, for what I'm gonna talk about in, in a little bit. So today, this is what the RAN looks like. Uh, you have uh, the UE, the, that's the user device, and that there is a very uh, well, well understood way of defining the air interface between that and the infrastructure. And the infrastructure really starts at the antenna, right? And then below it is the RAN vendor today. So today, if you look at this picture, the radio unit, this is the RU, the baseband unit, which is running all of the DU and CU functions, and then the management layer essentially is one black box. And often, this is delivered in a tightly coupled manner with the hardware itself, and the hardware could even be specialized hardware. It may not even be commodity hardware. So you essentially have multiple layers of integration happening between all of these different components that limits the openness, that limits the flexibility uh, to introduce new innovation, and that really makes this a silo onto itself. Right. So what ORAN is trying to do is uh, disaggregate and open this ecosystem up to, so the way I like to speak about this slide is go from this grayish world of view of the world to a rainbow view of the world, to have all of these uh, different colors and have, have a thousand flowers bloom, if you will, as we, as we open this up. So really have, uh, and some of the important uh, disaggregations that I wanna highlight is, decouple the radio unit from the software, right? So the radio could be delivered uh, from, uh, from a new set of vendors potentially with open interfaces uh, to the software. The software itself also gets modularized. So instead of the software being one glob of code, you modularize that into a distributed unit, that's the DU, into a centralized unit, the CU, and then the RIC, that's the RAM controller, right? So this is the control plane platform. And all of these elements interact with open interfaces to potentially a different vendor's uh, management plane on top. So you really have this nice picture of uh, different components uh, being able to be put together and get a best of breed uh, solution for each component that can work with other things uh, to put together a solution. And all of these, except for the radio unit, are uh, being delivered as virtualized or containerized software on off-the-shelf hardware. Right? So that's really the, the important piece, uh, the software and hardware decoupling uh, that's being highlighted there. So that's the end goal, right? That's the North Star uh, that ORAN is trying to get to. Now, if you really kind of start digging deeper into this and uh, look at kind of the different function, functional components of this architecture, uh, so there's the O cloud, and this is the underlying cloud infrastructure on top of which uh, you will be delivering these uh, network function workloads, uh, the DU and CU. And these network function workloads uh, similar to the core, are now this increasing movement to deliver them as containerized workloads uh, running on a cloud instance rather than something that's tightly coupled to the hardware. They're talking via what is called this open front all interface to the RU. And the idea there is that you should be able to mix and match the best radio hardware with the best uh, baseband software. 
without have them having to be from the same uh, same vendor. And then there are two sets of control loops basically, or three control loops. So there's one control loop that is very, very real time that happens at a millisecond time scale. And those are things that essentially run inside the network function because it's really hard to decouple them and run them in a separate instance. So these are things like uh, hybrid ARQ and such loops, right? That's running inside the DUNC. But the two that are relevant for today's discussion are the RIC and then the uh, service management and orchestration layer. So the RIC really is uh, a near real time one. That's the uh, blue one that uh, is being highlighted in the picture. That's allowing you to define open interfaces to run control loops uh, that run at time scales of 10 milliseconds to a second. So these are the kinds of uh, radio decisions uh, such as uh, load balancing, uh, handoffs and uh, slicing or uh, dynamic resource allocation for scheduling and so on that we'll talk about. These are the kinds of control loops that you want to run in the near real time, right? And then the management and orchestration layer is where it's more about configuration and, uh, and tuning and potentially root cause analysis and debugging, right? And that's the service management and orchestration layer. So non real time, so greater than one second. So I just want you to have this picture in your head as we talk about uh, talk about the stuff stuff uh, coming up forward. But these are, this is kind of the three layered, if you will, control plane. The, data, the way I think like to think about this is the bottom most layer, the cloud is the data plane. The near real time rec is the control plane, and the SMO layer is the management plane of the run. Right? And that's kind of ORAN. This is ORAN terminology, but for people used to networking, that's that's a maybe a decent enough one to one mapping data plane. Control plane is a near real time rig, and the management plane is the service management uh, and orchestration layer. So, uh, at uh, at uh, uh, from our, from I just want to kind of now talk about okay, where are things at, and what are the challenges, uh, and uh, how do we actually go about solving this uh, at VMware as well as together as an industry. So, on the user plane, on the data plane, as I called about talked about just uh, just earlier. So the first challenge has been, how do you actually run uh, radio network workloads on industry standard hardware? So there, there's been a long standing assumption that you need proprietary silicon to run radio networking workloads because they have pretty intensive latency as well as processing requirements. Uh, over the last few years, that has gone through a transition where Intel and now NVIDIA are delivering uh, uh, compute platforms that are not just for the RAM, that are general purpose compute platforms uh, that are now capable of uh, running the radio networking workloads. So one of the first challenges that, I, that we are seeing in the industry out there is that this ecosystem, which is running virtualized and containerized uh, radio network functions on commodity hardware, uh, is going through that, that inevitable growing pains of dealing with commodity hardware, making sure that everything works as expected, is, is ruggedized, is carrier grade, and is up, has the availability and uptime uh, that carriers desire and have gotten from proprietary implementations. So what is that carrier grade cloud platform, uh, which abstracts away all of the inevitable deficiencies that industry standard hardware might have, or failure modes that they might have, and use a resilient platform on top of which to run a mission critical latency sensitive workload uh, like the RAM. So that's one piece. And we are seeing early successes emerge on this. Uh, so you obviously seen, must have heard about Rakuten, which has been successful in rolling out an LTE network in such a fashion. And now recently Dish, uh, where Dish is gonna roll out its entire 5G network, including the RAN in a containerized fashion. Uh, and, and in fact, on a VMware cloud. Right, so including all the way to the DU. And I think the other thing I'll highlight about the DISH announcement is that uh, they are extending the cloud all the way to the cell site. And so that's actually an important point in a sense, the cloud does not mean that it is a cluster. It's a day central office or a data center where you have a collection of servers uh, that you can network together and so on. The cloud could literally be one server sitting at a cell site. And the intent is to have the cloud extend all the way there so that you have the same way of managing workloads regardless of where they're being placed. So that's the first aspect uh, that I wanted to highlight. The second aspect is the management plane. And this is where uh, the service management and orchestration layer sits, uh, sits in ORAN. And I think the challenge that I wanna highlight here that the industry needs to think through is when we go towards an open uh, 
uh, RAN deployment, when we go towards the virtualized RAN deployment, you're no longer just managing the RAN network function. So when we think about management plane today, we think about things like SON, which are very radio centric but the management plane in an open RAN deployment and in a virtualized deployment has to also incorporate the infrastructure layer itself. What's happening at the hardware? What's happening at the smart NIC? Uh, what's happening in the cloud substrate that's running on top? And be able to correlate the, uh, the analytics at this layer with what's happening at the network function layer. So tomorrow, your call may be, call may be dropping because there might be a faulty memory on some server uh, uh, sitting at the local data center. And so that's really, call drop is something you experience as a user, and that needs to be debugged and root caused all the way to the lowest layer in the hardware. And that actually is unique and new because of virtualization and openness uh, that's coming in the RAM, right? Which is, how do you build management planes that essentially can be full stack and can configure, orchestrate, and root cause across the full stack uh, as we start to deliver the RAM, which is gonna be a mission critical 5G service. Uh, on top of virtualized infrastructure. And this applies, by the way, even with uh, traditional non-virtualized networks, right? I, it won't obviously have the cloud aspects, but you kind of have the same aspects, which is how do you deliver uh, this, these kinds of management problems, especially when you have a multi-vendor uh, kind of deployment where not all of these functions are coming from the same, uh, same vendor. So those two are, uh, if you will, uh, bread and butter uh, things that you need to do to just at least have a competitive solution to an existing vertically integrated 5G platform. Now the last piece is the control plane. And this is, is, one of, is an area that is uh, new and is breaking fresh ground in OVAN, right? And what I mean by that is, historically there has been not a decoupled control plane in the RAM. Right? The control plane was subsumed inside the network functions. Uh, there was a management plane, even the management plane was tightly coupled to the underlying network. So you had to kind of get it from the same uh, vendor. But ORAN obviously wants to decouple that. But in addition, uh, ORAN is introducing essentially a new element in the network, which I'll just uh, refer to as a control plane. This is a near real-time RIC uh, that we're talking about. And so a lot of the control plane applications uh, that uh, were historically embedded inside the network functions the intent is to deliver them as apps uh, on top of the uh, on top of the platform, and th there's a number of reasons to do this. Uh, so one is, uh, of course, to have much more agility in the innovation that's happening uh, at this layer. Right? You want the ability to introduce new uh, load balancing algorithms. You want the ability to introduce new handover algorithms, new scheduling algorithms, whatever that is. And the reason for that is not just because you want, it, you want to be agile, it's also because different operators have different needs. So for example, what at t might need could be quite different from what Reliance Geo needs because the geographies are different, the way American and Indian cities are configured are different. And so today that innovation cycle is limited by the vendor supplying the equipment, but rather what we want to get to is that the operators are able to actually customize the infrastructure for what they need. So how do you get them to be able to deliver such innovation? The second, of course, is that we want to unlock and open this world up for startup innovation. Uh, today, that's not, this is not a space where there have historically been a lot of successful startups in the last 10 years. In fact, I'd say, I'd go as far as saying is that the venture capital industry just will, will not fund a startup in this space uh, because the perception, which is true, it's not just a perception, is that it's really hard for a startup to innovate and just focus on doing one thing well and introducing that capability into this ecosystem. So this control plane platform really is a means for opening the doors uh, to, to such focused uh, optimization. So there's a lot of, amazing research that's happening in universities uh, that uh, that has been published over the last 10 years and Guru is well aware we are both from the SICOM community. There's been a lot of wireless research and these are all the kinds of capabilities that could naturally find a home in this control plane of the RAM, but they have just fallen by the wayside because this part of the ecosystem has been closed. So how do we enable such innovation uh, in the RAN is kind of the other goal for this control plane. Now the last piece, no one uh, from an operator perspective, at, apart from being able to tune your network and enable new innovation, I think the last piece that is important that I'd like to highlight is that as operators make the enormous investment in 5G, uh, there's, there's always this question of what is the business case for 5G? 
right? And the business case for 5G is not selling more unlimited data plans. Uh, I don't think that the cons consumers will pay more for a 5G data plan compared to an LTE data plan. So from an operator perspective, how, how do you justify the investment uh, needed for 5G? And I, I think a lot of thinking is, how do you deliver enterprise services on, on top of a 5G network uh, that are differentiated? And so this is where, again, the control plane is a critical piece because it provides programmability into the network for operators to deliver enterprise services on top that leverage that programmability to be differentiated. So a simple example could be cloud gaming. Right? So cloud gaming today treats the network as a bit pipe, but as operators deploy an edge cloud, if the cloud gaming service could actually be able to uh, get real-time visibility into the radio network as well as program it to make sure that it gets the expected throughput and latency to deliver an interactive cloud gaming experience. That's the kind of differentiated services that consumers may be willing to pay more for. And so how do you actually deliver that differentiation? I think this kind of APIs and programmability is going to be a critical piece uh, to be able to deliver that monetization. So that's kind of the three-layered platform, similar to what we would do, what I was talking about in the rest of the network. Uh, but this is in the RAN, uh, there are multiple challenges at each layer uh, that need to be solved uh, before this becomes a reality. So uh, I'll just quickly go through this on the telco cloud itself, uh, on, the, on, uh, uh, on the data plane, uh, so, or the user plane, so-called user plane. Uh, the fundamental innovation really here is around how do you enable real-time workloads uh, to run on commodity hardware, on, on a hypervisor like uh, ESX, and on a Linux operating system. And so this is get, kind of gets into the guts of uh, uh, scheduling, operating system scheduling, and how you configure the underlying uh, system. And the challenge here is that the latency requirements for 5G is that a single task <coughs> can, the, the kind of latency guarantees you need to give is on the order of 10 microseconds. So this is where, how do you build real-time extensions to Linux? How do you uh, take a hypervisor and make it perform as if it's a real-time system is a critical building block. And, uh, and the, to be able to get, still get the benefits of virtualization, right? To, uh, to, and not have to tightly couple the uh, workload uh, to the underlying hardware. So that's the first piece. Uh, that's the uh, uh, VMware Telco Cloud infrastructure for VRAM where there is essentially a real-time operating system for uh, real-time workloads along with the uh, ESXi itself uh, that is now being optimized uh, for being able to handle such real-time workloads on the order of 10 microseconds. The second piece I'll highlight is the RIC platform. And uh, this is new. Uh, this is essentially, in my view, like an SDN controller, but applied for the RAM, right? And uh, this is a RIC platform that we're building. And the goal is, again, to enable an ecosystem of apps uh, to be able to deliver on top of this. And this is a bit of a loose analogy, but uh, I think it's something that most people will be able to relate to, which is how do we build an app store, right? So uh, that you can actually get an ecosystem of apps being developed potentially by new entrants into this space. Uh, so in ONF's case, I saw the announcement, for example, that Facebook and Google would be interested in building it. We would love that, right? So because these kinds of companies have services that have pretty demanding requirements running on top. And if they could del deliver X apps that can program the network such that their services can work better, I think it benefits everyone. Consumers get a better experience and operators are able to deliver a network that delivers a good experience to their, to their users. So that kind of ecosystem of X apps that can sit on top of a RIC platform. But the RIC platform itself has a bunch of uh, software uh, challenges that need to be overcome. And one of the, the one that I'll highlight uh, most importantly is obviously the latency. How do you make sure that this is running in software, uh, late control loops that are running at the time scale of 10 milliseconds. So how do you build software that can handle such control loops when there is code being introduced by an external party, right? You don't actually get to optimize everything. And two is conflict resolution. So when there are multiple such X apps, for example, uh, 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 Google could have an X app and, uh, and there could be another X app that's trying to program the same thing. How do you address conflicts uh, when they're trying to touch the same control knobs uh, sitting on top of this platform? So that, that actually is domain specific. So how do you do conflict resolution between these different, uh, different kinds of uh, applications on top is another key challenge uh, that is being solved. But I'll, I think just, just to kind of close this uh, slide, uh, really the goal here is how do we get 
to that ecosystem, right? And I keep hammering that uh, this, the platform doesn't succeed unless there is a healthy ecosystem. And so whatever we all can do, which is the operators, open source bodies like ONF, uh, uh, new entrants into this ecosystem, is how do we work, how, how, do, how can everyone work together to build a healthy ecosystem that provides an alternative and, and that provides a rich differentiated uh, uh, platform uh, for operators to deploy. I think that's what will uh, make or break uh, the success of this open RAN, uh, open RAN movement. So we, uh, I, I just wanted to end with this. Uh, so this is uh, uh, not just slide where uh, this is actually stuff uh, that, uh, that we built. And this was demonstrated at uh, Deutsche Telekom in partnership with DT earlier at M uh, this year around the MWC timeframe. It was slated to be a demo at MWC, which obviously got canceled. So this was uh, demonstrated on their campus there. But essentially an end-to-end -end, uh, radio network uh, with the core, uh, with all of those different components. Uh, the real-time cloud, uh, the rig, and then the orchestration layer on top, running an Intel uh, FlexRAN-based uh, BU and CU uh, on top, and being able to talk to existing handsets. Right? So these are standard iPhone handsets. And what was demonstrated really was that uh, with capabilities like the rig, uh, you could do very intelligent kind of radio scheduling on top in a decoupled fashion, and uh, deliver capabilities like uh, multi-user MIMO, uh, in a decoupled fashion on top of existing infrastructure uh, that can significantly improve spectral efficiency. So the point here is not this particular uh, technique. The point here is that we could actually introduce this kind of innovation in a completely decoupled manner without having to go patch the underlying base station itself as just a capability on top. And that's what we hope will get unlocked more uh, as more and more such capabilities uh, get developed. So I'll wrap up here. Uh, I think I just kind of want to make a little bit more larger comment. So this, there's a lot of terms embedded in this term ORAN and there's, and you kind of have to tease them apart. So this disaggregation, that's all about open interfaces. Right? Disaggregation does not imply a particular way of implementing each network function. It's really making sure that different components can talk to each other. That's about openness. And that's important because you want to reduce the barrier to entry for newer, smaller vendors so that they can focus on one thing, specialize on one thing and uh, deliver innovation there. And this disaggregation has been, uh, has been quite successful already. So you, you, in, you might have heard a lot about these open front hall interfaces. Uh, and what, has, what th that really is a reflection of this disaggregation philosophy is that for as long as we know, the interface between the radio hardware and the base station software was proprietary. And that meant that you essentially had to get both components uh, from, from the same entity. With this openness, with the open front all interface, we are now seeing the mushrooming of a number of smaller radio vendors. And this kind of new innovation happening in such an old space that has not been possible for the last uh, couple of decades. And so you see companies like KMW, MTI, uh, NEC, Fujitsu, Comscope, companies you typically would not hear of because they were subsumed behind uh, and they would never be kind of in front of the customer are now actually able to deliver products to the customer, do one thing well, which is the radio, and be comfortable that this will still work for the rest of the network. Right? So that's sort of disaggregation. Programmability is the next aspect. So programmability is where the rig comes in. And this is really about making sure that uh, we can kind of bring the same kind of benefits that STN brought to the rest of the world, uh, to the rest of the networking world, but to the radio access network world, right? How do we actually bring uh, uh, newer services, uh, newer network optimization capabilities uh, to this network? And this again, uh, uh, is kind of an independent con concept compared to disaggregation. You may not be disaggregated, but you could be programmable, right? So you could have the right interfaces uh, to have programmability. And that, but really I think uh, the kind of uh, implementations that will deliver programmability are, are very likely to be disaggregated too, right? So let me, that to be, to, be, to be clear. And both of these elements, can, the virtualization is about how you implement it. Right. Will you implement it in proprietary hardware or will you implement it in a virtualized fashion on commodity hardware? And so this is an implementation choice. And this really is being driven not just from a RAN perspective, honestly, I think this is being driven because the operators want to standardize on a common hardware infrastructure. 
you don't want to buy different hardware because it's the RAM and different hardware because it's the edge and different hardware because it's the core. So how do you create a supply chain or a diverse supply chain that's for the hardware and be able to source all of the compute hardware needed from, from, the, from the same supply chain, regardless of what workload you're running. And then uh, to make sure that the workload running on top does not actually have to be aware of the hardware, that's where virtualization comes in. So, which is uh, essentially give you the benefits of workload flexibility and give operators the ability to switch hardware underneath without having to change the workload uh, workload on top. So those are three independent concepts that are kind of coming together under this umbrella of ORAN. And each one of them has kind of unique challenges, but I think all three of them are seeing a lot of progress uh, over the last two years as momentum is shifting uh, towards opening up the ramp. So I'm quite hopeful, uh, now wearing my chair, hat, hat as the chair of the Oran Alliance, I'm quite hopeful and actually pleasantly surprised as to how quickly things have changed over li literally two years. Uh, this is not a world where two years is a long time. Two years is a, is a drop in the bucket uh, in this world. And I think uh, just the announcement of Rakuten and then DISH, uh, there's been tremendous transformation. And I think a lot more is gonna be announced over the next uh, two years. So with that, I'll stop. I'm happy to take questions. So Sachin, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's pretty uh, both insightful I and mean, given your experience for uh, so many years, very insightful talk. And then relating back to the VMware um, kind of uh, approach, uh, uh, very insightful and helpful. So, and I'm glad to hear that you are, um, you know, you have been uh, whatever, 10 years almost, you have been focused on this disaggregation, virtualization of LAN and uh, mobile networks. So you're, Optimism is uh, very good to know. Uh, still, tell me something that, you know, there is this competition among the carriers. Everybody is announcing they are deploying 5G and the, they are nationwide 5G. They are in so many metro areas and all these announcements are already happening. And carriers are already claiming to have 5G in their uh, networks and pretty large part of their networks. So whereas some of this disaggregation and some of this virtualization and all of this story still probably for products to mature, products to get ready and be consumed is a couple of years down the road. So have we missed the boat or is there still a window of opportunity where a large part of 5G will be based on these ideas, Rakuten and Dish are exceptions because they build a greenfield network in some sense, right? But if you take uh, any other major uh, MNOs, uh, whether that window of opportunity is lost. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's obviously a timely question uh, given what's happening in the world. Uh, so I think a lot of these 5G announcements, actually uh, many of them are requiring at least the open front all interface. So when they deploy right. the infrastructures, the radios themselves are getting disaggregated. And that sounds uh, trivial, but actually is an important point, which is what that implies is that, that even if tomorrow you want to go from uh, whatever, a proprietary RAM to a disaggregated and virtualized RAM, if you have implemented, if you have deployed your existing 5G with open front all interfaces, uh, then you don't have to go climb towers. You don't have to go change radios. Mm -hmm. It's more of a server upgrade, right? And so that gives you a window of opportunity to make sure that when the right architecture comes along, you can actually upgrade it without a big operational headache. Right? Second is, I think a lot of mid-band 5G is yet to be deployed. A lot of the 5G deployments today are low band, right? So which is basically, in my opinion, are uh, not that different from LTE. Yes, there are some features, but it's very similar to LTE in terms of what performance you can get. 5G's big promise is gonna be in mid-band and massive MIMO, right? And that transition is still, the, the spectrum auctions are still happening, and that transition is still a couple of years away. And I think that's gonna be an important inflection point uh, on whether this kind of new architecture will scale or not, right? And there's obviously a lot of noise in the ecosystem where, uh, such that people are talking about open RAN not being able to handle uh, things like massive MIMO and, uh, and mid-band spectrum. And I think that's, it's a challenge. I think it, there are technical questions that need to be answered over the next two years. But I do think that's kind of the next uh, transition point. Uh, so, uh, I want to, go ahead, please. please. 
No, I think I was just going to end with saying that uh, this. I think the more announcements will come over the next two years, where even though the RAN will be as potentially delivered by the same vendors as before, even for 5G, they are being delivered in a virtualized fashion on commodity hardware. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is from not just Greenfield, but Brownfield tier one telcos, right? Mm-hmm. And so just like that radio disaggregation, this compute disaggregation is also happening when they're rolling out 5G, even if the rest of the solution is not ORAN compliant, it's not programmable, it does not have the decoupled management plane. It's being delivered as virtualized software on top of commodity service. And I think essentially what that is signaling is that there's a lot of optionality still in being able to upgrade the software infrastructure when when these things mature. Because the biggest thing always is if you have to go change hardware, that's a non-starter. It's just tremendously expensive. I think if you have to go upgrade software, that's a much more digestible task to take very good. So I guess uh, one topic that is dear to me, I want to ask you, you definitely emphasize the commodity hardware and, you know, kind of thing. Uh, you didn't say much about role of open source. So tell me, um, you know, what do you think about, will open source play a role in the context of RAN and 5G, or it is such a difficult thing to get it right that uh, it will be hard? No, I, I think there will be there will be multiple, uh, just like it has happened in the rest of the network, right? Uh, that you will have flavors of platforms that are built out of open source components and flavors of platforms that are uh, that are uh, built out of proprietary components. I, I think this needs to be a distinction between uh, one is that you, regardless of whether you consume software that's open source or proprietary, you do want to have this modularity in the architecture that Oran is pushing for. Right. So that's the first thing. Now, given that, then there's a second level choice that the operator needs to make, which is, should I pick an open source set of software components for these platforms or should I pick uh, something else? And I think that's really a question of comfort level for operators. I think some operator level, operators are quite comfortable with taking on an SI role. Right? Open source, by definition, is not a supported product by some commercial entity. Right? It has to be, someone has to take on that responsibility. And I think some operators with enough scale can potentially are ambitious enough to do that. Uh, for a, la- a lot of smaller operators, that may be beyond kind of what makes sense for them given their scale. And in that case, they probably want to consume a solution. And even the solution from a commercial entity could be built out of open source components, like many will be, right? So I think open source is an important par- component of the supply chain. I don't think it's an either or choice actually. Right? Even proprietary solutions could be stitched together using open source code and delivered as, as a product uh, product to, to telcos. So uh, in my opinion, I think open source versus proprietary is a nuanced question. Open source, uh, as in the rest of the world, is I think a critical component of the supply chain in software. In no one company can build all the soft, software by itself. They have to leverage uh, open source components. And I think that's going to be true in the land too. Okay, one maybe last question because we are running out of time. So you mentioned mid-bank and so you must have uh, this morning looked at the CBRS auction and uh, what that means. So any insights on, first of all, the results of that CBRS auction um, that came out this morning, at least I saw them this morning, I don't know when they were announced. And then how will that play into this uh, future of 5G and um radio networks in general yeah i think uh, i mean i haven't looked at the auction results carefully but i think one thing i noticed is that there are bidders and winners of spectrum that you would typically not expect it's not just the cellular network operators there are cable companies and others who are also owning significant chunks of spectrum right and i think what that is saying is that because of the opening up of the RAN and because of even opening up of the spectrum uh, in the consensus of CBRS, we are gonna see new players in the wireless space, right? For example, if I'm a cable company that's delivering a wireless service as an MVNO, basically it's a virtual, it's it's just a reselling essentially someone else's network. And I can see that 
uh, I need a lot more, I have a lot of more traffic demand in, uh, in uh, downtown San Francisco and downtown New York. It's now possible for me to surgically add capacity myself by deploying a RAN there using this mid-band spectrum and then leverage uh, the MVNO network for the rest of the coverage. Right? And that actually is an important point because what that means is that uh, you can be a lot uh, deploying a radio network or a cellular network no longer is this prohibitively expensive exercise because of this open RAN ecosystem because of the availability of such spectrum you can be a lot more surgical about how you where you deploy your limited dollars in deploying radio network capacity and you target it where your load is right the same story holds true for stadiums and neutral host operators the same story holds true for private 5g where if you have surgical needs, you can now actually leverage solutions that are built with that kind of platform and openness in mind and can be deployed surgically for that. So I think this actually gives me hope because it's the, 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 the success or failure of this open RAN, open 5G ecosystem is not just dependent on the major telcos adopting it because there's a larger ecosystem of players who want to consume this and deploy it for different use cases than just delivering consumer broadband. And I think to me, that's the broader story. That's why it's important to have an open programmable platform because you cannot anticipate all the different use cases these different domains will have. And be building a one size fits all stack just for consumer broadband, which is what the major vendors will do because that's their biggest customers are using for that service. The, these long tail of use cases won't be served in that manner. And so that's where I think there's a lot of room in the ecosystem uh, that, that gets me excited. Very good. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I can continue this conversation, but unfortunately, uh, you know, we have run out of time. So again, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. And